In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At a recent gathering of our Good Shepherd Foyer group, several of us were discussing the dynamics that occur as our parents age, sometimes with illnesses like dementia, and how their habits, personalities change sometimes. One new friend told me that her father, who had been the Bishop of New York, whose taste tended to sophisticated things and intellectual pursuits, um, someone who taught systematic theology and read Greek and Hebrew as a hobby, now in his assisted living facility prefers watching, are you ready? The Jerry Springer Show. <laughs> I thought about that, and it reminded me that my own dad in his later years when he was at the Veterans Victory House, used to watch endlessly hour after hour after hour Judge Judy and all the other judges that would come on. And I thought about both of these things and it seemed to me that there is something viscerally satisfying about seeing people who have been naughty get their comeuppance, you know? And here we have it, uh, shirtless, deadbeat baby daddies duking it out while the deplorables are lifted up in Hillary's basket or whatever and taken away to hell. There you go. <clears throat> Makes people feel good when vengeance comes. And we watch these kinds of programs and we say, where do they get these people? <laughs> where do they come from? What, where, do they, where do they find them? I would suggest to you that in his parable today, Jesus is using that kind of scenario. I'm not saying the widow was on the Jerry Springer show, but I'm not saying that everything with her motives was necessarily pure sweetness and light anyway. And, and what do we know about widows in that period of time? She would have been desperately poor, not just a little bit poor, but desperately poor. And we know what poverty does to people, you know? There's sort of the Dickensian artful dodger that comes out uh, even in the most holy and, and sanctified of us. When it's um, a matter of eating or not, well, you got to pick a pocket or two, as the old musical puts it. And so I would imagine that this widow scouted out the movements of the judge. If he went to Starbucks, she was in line ahead of him, and just as he was reaching for his latte, she turned around and said, now, how about my case? Have you decided anything on that yet? Down in the corner square, he couldn't turn around without her being there. And even in the temple, she was there harassing him night and day. Poor man. When he went to say his prayers at night, he pulled out the Psalter, turned to Psalm 139, and there she was. If I go up to heaven, thou art there. If I go down to hell, thou art there also. That's what it must have seemed like to him. So, is the moral of the story as Jesus tells it, we all just pray harder, and if you pray hard enough, and if you bother me long enough, if you pester God enough, you'll just get everything that you want. You think that's the moral of the story? If that were the case, what becomes of the poor parents who stage a 24-7 prayathon for their two-year-old to be healed of cancer, and she is not. Father Mike and I have both been preaching and wrestling through all of these parables for weeks now. And doesn't it seem to you like he gets all the easy ones? <laughs> it does. Unjust steward, unjust judge, let thou have those. <laughs> But the point, the thread that we've been seeing in each of those is that this is not, even though some preachers do it, the, these parables are not exhortations to go out and try harder. You want to be more merciful, try harder. Be more merciful. You want to be more generous, just give away more money. You want to have more faith? Well, work harder in having faith. You want to pray? Well, work harder at it. 
And as I said to you two weeks ago, it's never the gospel, it's never good news if what the preacher is exhorting us to do is to try harder. Rather, the good news is that God has done each of these things superlatively for us. And having been on the receiving end of his love, his mercy, his generosity, his grace, then we are indeed transformed by our own sense of gratitude. So no, pray harder is not the gospel. It's not good news. Now, a little word study would help us better understand what's going on here. Maybe a hint. Remember when we were reading the gospel, we heard the the narrator say, for a while he refused. And then it says, but later he relented. And if we look at those words, we see that Jesus is inviting us to move from uh, from chronos time, chronological time, to kairos time. Entering into a a time more of kingdom time, uh, where eternity is past, present, and future all in one glimpse. Just as God sees time, not as how we see time. Now what is on the horizon for Jesus that's coming quickly that makes this difference in his life and in ours. Well, it is the cross and the resurrection that is about to happen, that is about to happen quickly. So what if rather than having the moral of the story, y'all pray harder, bug God until you get what you want, what if the point of the story is that because of what Jesus does on the cross, that God is getting out of the judgment business all together. He doesn't care if the whole court of human opinion thinks that he's a wacko god for dealing that way. He, in that sense, is like the judge. He doesn't fear public opinion, but he chooses by his own laying down of his life on the cross to not behave like the expectation of a god at all. Now, As you know, I always turn to my old friend, the late Father Robert Capon, when we get to these difficult parables, and he has a paragraph or two that explains this better than I can. So what if this is who God is? Is it who we proclaim him to be? He says it's the dilemma, the ultimate dilemma for the church. The one thing it doesn't dare try to sell for fear of being laughed out of town turns out to be the very thing it was sent to sell. But because more often than not it caves into the fear of ridicule, it gives the world the perennial spectacle of an institution eager to peddle anything but its authentic merchandise. He says of himself, I can stand up in my pulpit and tell people that God is angry, mean, and nasty. I can tell them that he is so good that they will never in a million years come close to measuring up to him. I can lash them into a frenzy of trying to placate him with irrelevant remorse and bogus good behavior, with sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings, all of which are offered according to the law. But I cannot stand there and tell them that their precious list of good deeds, responsible outlooks, and earnest intentions. I can never tell them that the God who has abolished all those oppressive godly requirements in order that he might grant them free acceptance by his death on the cross. Because when I do that, they may conclude only one of two things. Either that I am crazy, or that God is. But alas, God's sanity is the ultimate article of their non-faith. Therefore, Despite scripture's relentless piling up of proof that he is a certifiable nut, that he is the crazy eddy of eternity whose prices are insane, it always means that I am the one who gets offered the ticket to the funny farm. Well, what would it look like if we preached that gospel to the whole world and to our church and weren't ashamed of it, and we didn't get into the rules business, but to remind people that what God has done in Christ on the cross takes him out of the judgment business. And rather than saying to people, you have to be more this and more that and more the other, instead we just let them be. And in the old folks' home of eternity, 
Perhaps the only more that they would have to do is to laugh more and to love more. I think that's the gospel that we proclaim in this place. And I think it makes a difference in our lives and in the lives of all who come into the saving embrace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray these things in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.